Good morning. How's everybody doing? All right. Well, welcome back to session number two of the Citizens Academy. We are very glad you're here. I am expecting, uh, hopefully, Connie and Stephanie, so hopefully they'll step back in. But uh, it's been a good week for us. Hopefully you guys have had a good week. Uh, I think we have a really exciting uh, three sessions today for you. Today we're gonna talk about code compliance and animal control. We're gonna talk about our finance department. Welcome ladies. And we are also going to talk about our community development area. But what I'd like to do is, I'd like to ask a few people their thoughts from last week. Scott, do you have a thought about last week and what you learned? I guess the, the main thing I learned was from the public information officer, the different outlets that uh, the residents can receive information on what the city's doing. And that's a great point. And Kat and her team are here today, and and it's it's important. And I think Brandy and I were talking a little bit this morning. And in it's information, it's communication, it's transparency. And how do we get that message out there? And I think that's what citizens want. And I think that's what we want as our our staff members. So we thank you. And I'm always going to go to Zach. He is our our uh, right out of high school graduate. And uh, tell me a little bit about what you took away last week. Uh, last week, uh, oh, whoops, sorry. Uh, last week, I definitely took, took out a lot, especially when it came to the uh, city clerk position in, and definitely the roles and responsibilities and the more nuanced parts of that at, and how the operations run and stuff. And I found that quite interesting. Well, beautiful. So we do have a, you know, full slate of uh, information to share with you today. and. Um, we are going to get started with our Code Compliance and Animal Control Division, and believe it or not, you get to hear from me. So Danny Ron is our Code Compliance Manager, and he's on vacation. So that is one of the areas I get to work with each week that I come to the city of Deltona. And so they have prepared us a nice presentation, and we're going to go through that because code enforcement is a, and animal control, is, they're, they're unique opportunities for the city to work with the citizens and the residents because a lot of times there's a misunderstanding. It's like code's not doing anything. Have you ever said that or heard that? People feel that way. Yes. Our officers, our supervisors deal with it. Matter of fact, yesterday and into last week, we've dealt with some citizens at the counter that feel we're not doing our job. And, and it's not, we're not doing our job. We have processes. We have things we have to go through. So uh, Mark, uh, raise your hand. Mark uh, Gibson, he is one of our code compliance managers. You'll hear from him shortly. And then Josie, she is, raise your hand. She is one of our recently promoted lead code compliant uh, supervisor leadership role person. And we're happy to have both of them here because they're really skilled in the animal control area, which I am not. So, um, and before you leave in that yellow envelope, I will share with you that there is a wonderful, colorful brochure for your reading pleasure all about poisonous snakes. But I did not put it at your desk because I have a fear of snakes and I was not going to put it on your table, but please make sure you take one with you. So let's see if we can get into code compliance. So as you can tell, we have 98,000 plus residents, 41 square miles, and we have, let's see, the divide, okay, so our code officer, or code compliant officers are divided up into five different zones. What we do is we do the commission zones, correct? Uh, or six? Yes and no. Yes and no, okay. So, but we are divided up into uh, five zones. We work seven days a week. Mike, did you know we work seven days a week? Yes, ma'am. Awesome. We work 12-hour shifts. Well, they work 12-hour shifts. I don't. Uh, they work 12-hour shifts. That way, we are covering the weekends. And so what they do is they will go out, they will respond to complaints, and they will also have some proactive officers that will go out and not respond to complaints but look for code violations. So we're, we're out there in many, many fashions. So let's see, local ordinances, what we do is, and I think Brandy maybe helped me out here. Um, do you know how to find our code ordinances online? Yeah, but I, I can't wait for that. To, uh, yes, but the website getting redone would be uh, beneficial. 
Oh, okay, and that's good Good for Kat to hear that. Um, yes, so you can go online, you can look up our ordinances, and you can find out, you know, some of the things out there. But what they look a lot at is parking on the lawn, overgrowth on yards, we do abatements, and you're going to see something about abatements. And I'm going to have Mark take the microphone and come on up, please. And uh, Mark's been a code compliance officer for mm, 23 years? Well, working for the city. Working for, working for the city 25 years. So let, let me let Mark talk a little bit about abatements. Good morning. Good morning. Um, what I'm going to try to do is explain a little bit of, um, how the abatement process goes. So basically, if you phone in a complaint and we take the information down, we'll dispatch an officer out there to take a look at the property. Um, once the officer gets there, um, they make an assessment of, you know, how much debris or, because you can also go into as far as just lawns alone, but in this particular instance, it's more than likely it's going to be for debris. I actually know this house. Um, so at that point, what we'll do is we'll tag it. We give them um, seven days to give them due process to bring the property into compliance. Um, at that point, we, and I'm just going to try to expedite this a little because I can get technical with it, but we'll try to break, we um, come out, if the property is still in, in compliance, we will bring it to our staff. Our staff would then get a contractor. We have um, contractors that the city use and we'll send the contractor out there and, and they'll obey the property. So does anybody have a question about abatements? Jim? Okay. Yeah, microphone. If you get a complaint from a neighbor and you go out and take a look at it, do you make recommendations on how they can com com come into compliance or is it just uh, do something? Okay, that's a great question yes. because when it comes to making recommendations, what we will do, every time you receive a complaint, uh, we receive a complaint about something and we come and address you, with, it should be a corrective action. So with that corrective action, it should explain what you need to do and how you could voluntarily come into compliance, because that's what we're looking for, voluntary compliance. So there will be some form of um, a corrective action there. So Mark, if you would, if, if we're not dealing with an abatement, what is our other process when somebody does not come into compliance? Okay, uh, there are several routes. You can go a civil citation, or we can also give them um, a courtesy notice, which is also gonna give you time to bring the property or into compliance or whatever the code violation is. And then we'll give you a notice of violation next. So we try to work with you and give you ample time to, to make sure you can get to bring the property into compliance again, voluntarily, because, um, and after that, we can go as far as what we have special magistrate hearings where you're notified and you come before the um, special magistrate and she can rule on your case. Well, she can also give additional time, fines, and so forth, which we try, that is the last scenario. So Hopefully. so the special magistrate, they meet on Wednesday evenings, the last Wednesday of the month? Yes, ma'am. That okay. would be the last, and it's here in the um, commission chambers. Is it open to the public? It is open to the public. Okay, so if anybody's interested, they could come on the last Wednesday of the month that we start at 5.30? Yes, ma'am. 5.30, and you could listen in, or it's also online. So, so there's a good opportunity to continue to learn about code enforcement because, again, it's kind of, would you agree, Mark, it's kind of one of those areas where, and again, you and I and Josie have experienced it in the last few days, where we are doing our due diligence. We are working with where the violation is, but sometimes the perception is nothing's being done. Right. It's, it's a process. Um, everything isn't, because we do try to work with the citizens and, you know, to bring the property into compliance. Again, Keyword, and you'll hear me say it over and over, is voluntary compliance. So, um, when it normally when it's get gotten to the point of special magistrate, you've gotten notices sent certified mail. Um, you know, it, we've we've tried all we can to. Like I said, that's the last. We're at the last. Beautiful. Thank you, Mark. So again, does anybody recognize this property? 
This sits right on your beautiful Saxon, right by the highway. So, so again, this was an old Sitco. It still stands today. And this is one of the ones that I'm looking forward to uh, coming to a closure. But what's happening with this property, just to give you full disclosure, is this property it has a running fine with the special magistrate. It is set for demolition by the property owner, and they do have a permit. So keep an eye on this area on Saxon. It's a 2,000 block of Saxon, and hopefully in the next week it'll be gone. So we'll be real proud of that. Um, vacant lots, we do things on vacant lots, um, improper parking. Mark, how prevalent is parking problems for you and your crew? Okay, this is a big one. <laughs> because the problem, what makes it so difficult with improper parking is it can be improper parking for 15 minutes, it can be improper parking for 15 days. You never know, a lot of people will say, um, citizens will say, well, Hey, they just got here, or whatever. Well, I'll explain to them. I have no way of knowing if you just arrived or if you've been here 10 days. Because like um, Suzette said earlier, it's 41 square miles. So I could just happen to be coming by, and I'm gonna use you, Brandon, since I know you. And there's a vehicle parked in Brandy's yard. They may have just come there to have lunch or dinner or whatever. We have no way of knowing that. So that's why we'll start out with an initial courtesy notice. Uh, a lot of people don't look at it as a courtesy notice, but that's what it is. It's just um, <laughs> educational, it's informational, and letting you know that, hey, there's an issue here, and the courtesy notices normally will go seven days, or we can verbally, you know, the thing we wanna do is get out, knock on the door, hey, how you doing, you know, um, what we got here, oh, this is my, cousin just drove up from here. Okay, well that's not a problem at all. Um, just wanna let you know that the city does have an ordinance about vehicle being improperly parked. You can park either on the driveway or what we call a driveway extension. Um, so, but again, we look for signs. Um, a lot of times when it's improper parking on a regular basis, you'll start seeing wheel ruts. Um, or high grass around the vehicle if it hasn't moved anytime soon. Uh, but it, normally if it's a, a pattern, it's gonna leave evidence of it through the grass, the lawn, or whatever the case might be. But it's really a difficult one to deal with because again, those could be there now, and 15 minutes later they leave, so. Just right, and that, that's something we dealt with in the last few days with a commercial vehicle. You know, the complaint that makes the complaint, we go out and vehicle's gone, and you know, that's kind of the process that the staff have to go through. So let's see, um, so animal cruelty. I'm gonna let um, Josie, thank you, Mark. We appreciate your time. Um, I'm gonna have Josie come up and talk about, she's got a little presentation here uh, and some equipment she's gonna show you. But I'll say this to you, your staff that works in code compliance, they are um, duly certified in code enforcement and in animal control. So they have to, matter of fact, we had five or six staff members last week go get their, it's called Phase One, which is Florida Association of Code Enforcement to get their certification. So these staff, they have to stay with CEUs, which is continuing education to keep their credentials up. So they go to school, they get training, and again, they, they can do either the code side or the animal side just based on the calls. Josie, go ahead and start. Okay, good morning. All right, so with animal control, um, it goes alongside with code and code compliance, it's pretty much we're in the same department. So our number one concern is always gonna be the health, safety, and welfare of all residents, residents also including animals, okay? So with animals, we do get calls, um, you know, well-being checks, you know, a dog's been outside or um, there's a dog running loose in the city. Um, we do go after those calls. We also do wildlife here, which is kind of fun for me. Um, you know, so that would include raccoons and hawks, which I did a hawk the other day. It was a lot of fun. So I'm just going to go over a few of the items that we do use. Um, we do have animal control trucks and we also have code compliance trucks. The, um, we call them ACO trucks. Um, you'll be able to see them, they look like ice cream trucks. <laughs> they got like the little kennels. 
Um, so we do have the catch poles, which is what we use to grab animals that are at large, meaning they're loose in the city. Um, so, you know, they just basically, it goes in, we close them up, and then we load them onto the trucks. The trucks are AC, so they are comfortable in their trucks. Um, probably better than outside, it's like 100 degrees outside nowadays, so those trucks are nice. Um, we also have traps. Um, I have a trap here that I've pre-made. So basically, um, sometimes we'll get like a sick or injured animal that needs help, but they're not willing to come to us or it's hard for us to capture them. So we do have sometimes set up traps for them. We'll bait them with some food um, and then the animal will go in obviously and then we'll capture them safely without injuring them further. And we'll take them to a local facility that we go to to um, take them. Usually it's the Halifax location, but we take them to a location that we are contracted with to help them. Um, we also have regular cages for wildlife. We also put cats in here. Um, we can put, you know, maybe um, injured wildlife. Um, we put those in there as well. We do have a lot of safety. Um, we have safety gloves for those that deal with, ho I dealt with a hawk. Um, you don't want to get those nails on you. Um, what were you dealing with a hawk for? So the hawk was, um, we don't know 100% what happened to the hawk, but the hawk was um, found by a resident. It was in the front yard of the resident, um, and the hawk was alert, was awake, but the legs would not move. So they were straight out like this. Mm. So I don't know if the hawk maybe got paralyzed or whatever the case is, but the hawk was still alive. So that to us is a quality of life. So at this point, we know that if we don't pick this hawk up um, and take it to a, a facility, you know, something else can pick it up, you know, an, a, a vulture or we do have bears here in the city of Deltona. We have coyotes, we have wildlife, other wildlife um, that will, you know, take the hawk. So we did go out on the call. I did, you know, look at the hawk. The hawk was alert, but wasn't able to fly away. It was on the ground. So, you know, I transported it to our uh, wildlife facility where they went ahead and took care of it. So that's what happened with the hawk. Beautiful. And, and there's another bird story that I remember, and I'm not sure if you were a part of it. Um, we were trying to get a sandhill crane, correct? Yes. We were trying to capture a, one of the, the cranes because the beak was broken, and so it couldn't eat. Correct. So, but I understand now that somehow the bird has kind of rejuvenated itself, so it's able to eat. It's yes. It's remated with its mate. But the yeah. team, this is your team. The team just talked about it for days and was very focused again about the well-being of right. their safety. Yeah, our number one concern like I said, it's the well-being and safety of the residents and that does include wildlife because we do share with wildlife here <laughs> um, and that also includes residents pets that are loose in the street you know, they might have accidentally went through a fence. I think there's a picture here of a dog. Obviously, I don't know if you guys can tell but obviously the dog is not in good conditions, showing bones, um, so that would be a neglect. Um, so we would figure out who the owner is by checking if it has a microchip. Uh, we do have chip readers on the trucks. So if animals are found, that's the first thing we do is take a picture of them and check them for a chip. That's important. Um, and then try to find the owners. If we cannot find the owners, then obviously we will take them to a facility where he can get some help, he or she, I don't know, um, can get some help. Um, but again, it's, it's all about quality of life. It's all about making sure that we are doing what we can to make sure that everyone's safe. We definitely don't want to, you know, the dog loose in the city. You know, there's kids running around, um, you know, they can, he can go into someone else's yard and that dog may be dog aggressive. So it's just, it's, it's, it's a win-win for everyone. So animal control is very important. And let me say this, Josie, and you're one of the people I'm talking about, is some of your staff that work on the animal side of the house here are actually trained vet techs. So some of them have gone through some real significant training before they arrived at the city of Deltona. They bring that to us, and between their training and their love and their passion for animals, feel secure that they are really uh, looking out for them. Go ahead. Absolutely. Yep. Like, um... I have, I'm a certified veterinary technician. I've been a technician for 10 years. Um, so I 
I'm comfortable with surgeries and all that. And this is a type of job that you have to feel comfortable dealing with animals. You have to understand body language. You have to understand how to read them, how to assess them. And those are things that you learn, obviously, with time. But yes, you're correct. There's a lot of our officers are fully trained. And if we're not, then we do take the classes to make sure that we are fully trained to be able to assess the situation. And I'm going to put Josie on front street again, because in the first few months that I was here, and, and I've already told some of you my fear of snakes, and that's one of the things we actually have to deal with is snakes. Yes. And and I remember one day, I was I think I was talking to Mark, and I was listening that uh, uh, Josie had to go capture a five-foot rattlesnake. And I'm like, is Josie okay? Didn't I say that, Mark? I said, oh my gosh. You know, so they have to have some courage and, 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 and some real stability within them to, to do that. And I know that was a little scary. I, I would think it was a little scary. It was a scary just to hear about it. So rattlesnakes are something we deal with and uh, rattlesnakes and gators and, you know, so they do a great job. So do you want to wrap up with your snake? You want yes, to show so them your snake bucket? Yep. We so do not have we, a snake in the room. We, we do not have a snake. Um, but yes, she is correct. We do also do go out for snake calls. Some people may have a snake in their backyard. Number one thing we'll ask is what does it look like? What are the colors? Like, what is it? Because it's easily, it could be easily mis- construed. We have regular snakes that are not venomous, and then we have venomous snakes, like rattlesnakes. Well, the rattlesnakes that we have here in Deltona are the diamond backs. So if you look up Google diamondback rattlesnakes, you'll see what they look like. Um, and there's plenty of them here. <laughs> um, and they're not fun. I mean, once they start coiling up, you know, and they start rattling, you know, you start feeling some type of way. But yes, we do have equipment. Um, we recommend wearing gloves, obviously, to make sure that you're safe at all times. And we do have the snake tongs which we use, oh, it's this way, the snake tongs that we use. And the way we grab them, it's just, we assess, I assess the situation first just to kind of see how big they are. Um, you know, you don't want to grab them by their necks, but you want to grab them a little bit further out towards the abdominal area. But of course, everything is situational. For me, for venomous, I don't want to take any chances, so I'll go closer to the, to the head if possible, and then I just grab it uh, with the tongs, put it in the bucket, make sure I close up the bucket, and then it has a little latch here where we'll, we'll seal it shut. Now, venomous snakes, we do transfer out of the city um, for safety purposes. We do take them out of the city to another area. We we call it the reptile sanctuary. Um, his name is Carl. He's amazing. Um, and he takes all of our venomous snakes, which is great because we don't want them here. Um, <laughs> but if they're not venomous, then, you know, we would find another location. Um, but we would assess it. We have coral snakes that look like coral snakes, but they're really not. Um, so those are things that we would assess at the time. Well, thank you, and, and I'll be right there, Brandy. And when everybody leaves today in that envelope over there, you're welcome to take a very beautiful, colorful brochure of venomous snakes. Brandy. I actually had a couple questions. Um, the first one is regarding TNR mm -hmm. and uh, that program. Um, we have a few TNR cats uh, that actually kind of hang out in, in, in my house, and I've been feeding them for years because, you know, I have cats in the house. So it doesn't matter. But when one of them have an injury, what do you do with that? Do Does TNR come back out and then still take care of the cats that they have trapped and re-released, or, or how does that work? Okay, I, I think it's two-part. Um, I'm going to let Josie talk about how we deal with an injured animal, but I'll take the first piece. So we have a TNR program, Trap and Release. Your city dollars uh, provide us a budget to help spay and neuter uh, stray cats. And we do that yearly. We spend somewhere around $70,000 a year to spay and neuter. That, those dollars do not cover injuries. So I'm going to let you talk about Correct. injury so repair. Animal control does take care of sick and injured pets. So that does include a sick and injured animal. Um, so you would call animal control, let them know that you have a sick and injured animal, make sure the animal is contained in some way. Um, you know, we're not. So, you know, once the animal is contained, then we do transfer them to our local facility. Our closest one would be the Halifax location is where we would transfer them. And we would take care of that, of, of course. We don't want sick or injured animals out you know, in the streets. We don't want them injuring themselves more. So that's what we would do. And, it, and that goes for any animal, any sick or injured animal, including TNR. 
Beautiful. Does that help, Brandy? Did you, you had a secondary? The, the second question was just code enforcement. How many staff per shift? Because it said, you know, the five. We do that. Yeah, I, I did skip over that. So, well, let's thank uh, Josie. So we're all set with the animal stuff because um, we appreciate you. And, and, and as you leave today, you know, come up if you want to touch, see, use the snake grabber. You're more than welcome to. Um, okay, so the staff, again, is built with uh, Danny Ron, code compliance manager. Then you have three code compliance Compliance supervisors. Two are in the field, Mark Gibson and Marion, and again, they split their shifts. And then we have a uh, code compliance administrative supervisor that oversees a special magistrate, budgets and supplies and a lot of details like that. Then each shift has seven officers. Seven officers per shift. We, in the past, have had eight per shift, but at this time, uh, you know, doing an assessment, seven is appropriate. We're handling what we need to handle, and staffing is in great place. Um, so again, I've done code enforcement since about 1996, believe it or not. I'm really old, and um, but it's been a great journey. Code enforcement hasn't changed over all those years. It's still some of the same complaints, the parking complaints, the noise complaints, and you know, the things that the current staff are dealing with today. Your your staff is very diversified. It's, it's interesting because, again, we have people with, you know, veterinarian backgrounds and all kinds of stuff, but you have staff that has started in the last two weeks. You have staff that's been here a year, and you have folks like Mark and Danny that have been here 20 plus years. So it's it's really nice to to, to watch the leadership grow the whole team. So it's, it's a great team. So any other questions before we kind of roll into, yes, let me come back here to Stephanie. Thank you. Um, kind of piggy piggybacking off of what uh, Jim asked earlier um, about specific instructions on how to come into compliance. So if a person received a, a notice and they were a little bit confused on where to go from there, could they call to get more details or um, is is uh, can is there a way that they can speak to someone and get more insight on okay what specifically was being looked at if the notice was vague? Oh, absolutely. And then I do have one more after that. Absolutely, I'll let uh, yeah Mark or Josie whichever. You want to take that? Yep. Absolutely, that's a good question. Um, so n normally we would leave a courtesy notice on the door. The courtesy notice will give you sort of a vague idea. It'll have the ordinance and it'll tell you what you need to do. On the back of that, there's always going to be a phone number where you can call and then the officer information. So you will know who came to your house um, as far as the information. You would call the number and ask to speak to that officer and then you guys can have that one-on-one -on -one conversation on the phone so that you guys can go into specific specifics of what's the actual violation, how it can be corrected, um, and again, everything is situational circumstances and conditions. So at the end of the day, it just depends on what the violation is and how long it's going to take to go into compliance. Did that help, Stephanie? Yeah, I did. Okay. So uh, going back to that slide that had uh, what looks like basically a hoarder situation. Mm -hmm. um, obviously that kind of thing does not happen overnight. There's something very, very wrong on that property. Something, you know, was happening. Um, looking at that, I don't see how someone could take care of that in seven days. So what kind of process would that sort of, um, would, would a person in that situation follow? Like, um, are there resources available or, because sometimes people just don't know what is there, what's available, um, and they may not be physically able to handle that themselves. If they're an elderly person, they live alone. Um, so are, are there other resources that code compliance can put them in touch with and then come up with a plan to over time take care of that and then they still are able to get into compliance without necessarily being heavily penalized because they're clearly someone who does not have help. Right. And, and you know, Stephanie and Mark's going to address that, but what, what a great whole thought process with that because again if you think about it too and staff in the last few months have had some training on mental health and sometimes some of these folks that are involved with hoarding hoarding becomes a mental health issue so it's very good but mark would you address her con question please okay um we have to really be careful about making recommendations 
um, because that can swing both ways. Um, but with that particular case, like I said, I looked at the photograph. That wasn't the first time. And as Suzette alluded to, sometimes it gets to be a, a mental issue. Um, and you get elderly, hoarding, when you get to hoarding, it's in a whole different ball, um, ball game. That's not your typical person that goes out and collects or whatever, you know, a little knickknack here or they've seen a chair they want in a pile. This was on a regular basis. Um, it might have, wow, I want to say maybe three times. And, and when you saw that photo, did you? See, it was track marks there. They had to bring a front end, um, a back, not a backhoe, but um, skid steer, um, and to actually load up. There was dumpsters full, um, and they're they're a sweet couple. Um, so. You make recommendations, you can make all the recommendations you, you want. Um, we've had, um, I remember one time when we went, this was a few years back, that some church members came and um, cleaned it up or whatever and stuff. Sometimes the churches, um, they'll reach out and they'll come in and they'll clean it up. But when it's um, a hoarding situation, it's right, right back. Um, give them a month or two and it, it comes back. So at that point, you know, it kind of ties your hands. We can recommend and try to, it's, it's the same thing even with animals, you know, so you, you start getting into a, a, some medical issues at that point. So I think I think going back to where Stephanie was going is 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 the staff will assess. They will look. They will see what our resources are, and it's case by case. It, there's no just okay. This is how we're doing it. It's we have the law that we have to follow, but then we look at each situation individually. As long as they're willing to work on it, you guys. Oh, we were. Oh, that's, yeah, that's with any of our cases. I mean, if, if there's some progression or or you know, um, you know, we're human. Um, we have a job to do, so we understand, you know, hey, I, I, I just had this. I had a death in my family. What it, when we use, um, I like to use the term um, circumstances, situations, and conditions a lot in my staff meetings, so I'm sure that's where she picked that up from. But uh, <laughs> um, yeah, it, it's, it's not, it's ordinances set in place. And, um, but it's still ways to still handle it. If some, everybody doesn't need the exact same amount of time. So if you, seven days, it's not like at the seventh day at 12 o'clock, we're standing out there, you know, with sickles and pitchforks. Um, so we, we wanna try to give you time to, to bring the problem. Again, it's voluntary compliance. Okay. All right, we have time for one more question, Pamela. Okay, so um, to, Add to what she said, I worked for a company years ago as a team leader, and we went into hoarders' homes specifically. And it is a multifactorial issue. My question is, do you have a list of organizations people in these situations can contact for help? Because a lot of times these people are so deeply involved and it is so multifactorial, they don't even know where to reach out to. They don't even have family they can depend on for help. And there are not-for-profit organizations as well as for-profit organizations that can help in these situations. And I would think that with the growing elderly population we have in the state of Florida, especially Deltona, as well as uh, those with uh, lesser abilities, um, you're going to see more and more of these kind of situations. And if you went out on a call and, and had to give them some kind of courtesy notice or citation, providing them with a list saying, you know, look, we don't, these are p places we know of. We don't recommend to any of them. It's up to you to choose. Um, but, you, you know, this is a starting point. No, absolutely. Well, there are some outreach programs, um, and there is a, so you a list. list somewhere. Okay. Uh, but, but, but we, yeah. yeah. Th there's outreach programs and, and we will try to, if, you know, if we can, mm -hmm. you know, you might want to look at Mark's help a lot or whatever. I don't know. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, again, yeah. it, it's situational because yeah. some don't want help, That's you know. Well, and some, it's like days after you leave, they're looking at that list and then they finally decide to call a number. Mm -hmm. Right. They're still right. so in the moment of, oh my God, right. this mm -hmm. person came mm -hmm. who ratted me out. Right. But, yeah. right, and, and, and that's a great, you know, I appreciate what Mark said is, yeah, we have one, but, you know, are we readily using it? I don't know. So we'll, we'll go back behind the curtain and we'll, we'll look because it's a great idea. 
Yeah, yeah, that's a, talk to me after. That's a good idea. But we do need to move on to our next segment. So again, thank you, Josie. Thank you, Mark. And we appreciate your service out there in the community. Um, as I ask Mary to come up, Mary is our finance director. She's been here a long time, but I'm going to let give her a second to get set up and get the PowerPoint to be changed. So while she's doing that, in front of you, you see today's agenda, but what I'd like to do is get you to look on page two, because I want to give you plenty of time to see, see my big red marks there on page two. We will be going out to a park, and we will be going to one of the public works locations, so I want to make sure that everybody has plenty of time to prepare. I'll make sure you have some water that day, but uh, the Park and Rec's presentation sounds really fun, and um, I think you'll really enjoy it. It. So I just wanted to make sure that you saw, um, in case you have any, you know, transportation you need to arrange or anything like that. So at this time, I'm going to turn it over to Mary from our finance department, and we welcome her. And I will do the same thing like I did last week. I'll walk around for questions. Mary? My name is Mary. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's good. Yeah, we're good. Hello? Yeah, I think you're on, Mary. It is on? Can you hear me? Okay. Um, my name is Mary Lyson. I'm the finance director. Um, I'm a certified public accountant as well as a certified government finance officer. I moved to the city of Deltona in 1989. I raised three daughters in the city. Um, I've been a volunteer in the community through the schools and church. And uh, the reason I share this with you is um, I'm not only a city of empl Deltona employee, this is my community and it's also my home. I do want to say something about Mary. I, I understand she's kind of grown through many positions here at the city, and she started in community development, correct? I did. Uh -oh. and, and now she's running the finance department, so I just wanted to give her a shout out. Thank you. Um, when I was first asked to do this presentation, uh, the first question that came to mind was, what would anybody, what are the residents interested in the finance department? What do you want to know? And then my second thought was, what do I want to share with you so you have a better understanding of what we do here? So this was what I imagined that you would want to know about us. First, what does the finance department do? What are the resident uh, revenue sources? What are the residents paying? What do we spend our money on? A question that frequently comes up is our debt. How much debt do we have and what have we spent it on? And um, also, how can you find the answers to these questions outside of this uh, academy? And what I wanted to share with you is who are the members of the finance department? Um, what is the regulatory environment that we function in? I'm sorry, I can't see the slides way over there, so. <laughs> um, and how do we produce, do or what documents do we produce for compliance with the state, um, with GASB, the debt holders, and our auditors? And also, I want to talk a little bit about government accounting, and I hope I don't bore you to death with that, but it's important to understand the revenue expenditures. This is the finance department. There's 13 of us, and although this is the hierarchy, we're really absolutely 100% a team. We all get along great. We work really well together. They're, um, they're the most hardworking, ethical people I know. Um, then we have a deputy director and also a finance manager. The finance manager is primarily um, is responsible for the general ledger. We have two people in purchasing. And we have a budget coordinator who's extremely busy at this time of year, and a finance coordinator. She handles most of the revenue intake. We also have three accounting technicians, a payroll administrator. We have two people who do accounts payable, um, another accounting tech that just fills in all the spaces, and we have one person. He, he's in the fixed asset. He's actually located outside of City Hall. He uh, is responsible for the fixed assets and the inventory. Oops. Um, the state of Florida and the city's charter require that the city produce a set of audited financial statements annually. Um, the finance department is required to follow many state laws that exist to ensure the long-term um, fiscal viability as well as transparency for citizens, bondholders, and um, business partners. 
The finance department files numerous reports to the state of Florida throughout the year in order to remain in compliance with state statutes. Um, two of the documents that we produce is our um, comprehensive annual financial report. This is available um, on the website in PDF format. This takes about six months to produce. And what we're working on right now is um, the annual budget. It takes about six months also to produce, and you can see it's rather lengthy. It's full of all kinds of information other than budget, even like demographics on the city, um, our strategic plan. I don't know if you want to go home and read it all. <laughs> Most people wouldn't find that um, is interesting, but it's available if you have questions. Um, the, city, the finance department follows generally accepted accounting principles, which are the accounting rules, requirements, and practices that are issued by the Financial Accounting Standards Board and also the Government Accounting Standards Board. Um, they are independent organizations that establish the accounting rules and finan financial reporting for the United States. We, the city is also a member of the Government Finance Officers Association and the Florida Government Finance Officer, Officer Association. Um, for the past 20 years, the Finance Department has participated in this award program, and we've been awarded a Distinguished Budget Presentation Award and also um, Excellence for Financial Reporting. Um, and after these two books are produced, we submit them to um, undergo a peer review throughout the United States. We're randomly assigned to three different peer reviewers that take a look at our document um, and evaluate us, and also it's useful because because they provide um, recommendations as well. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about um, government accounting because it is different than business accounting. Most businesses operate, they produce a good or a service that people pay for, or they produce and people buy directly, and they take the revenues minus expenditures to come up with net income. That model has the profit motive, which is different than a government. Um, we don't have a profit motive, so it doesn't make sense to have that same financial accounting model, so we use government accounting. And the, the um, motive behind that is accountability. And so what government accounting has is it's fund accounting. And um, underneath the city of Deltona, there's two boxes. One is government funds, and the one on the far right is proprietary fund. And now that I just told you that we don't function like a business, here's the exception. The proprietary fund functions most similarly to a business, and we only have one fund, and that's the, the utility. Deltona Water is a proprietary fund. So they do have the same financial um, protocol that as a business. Now, having said that, I don't know if you can see that very well, but um, the rest of them are funds. And for lack of a better description, they're like buckets of money. So the first one on the far left is is the general fund, and this is the primary fund of the government. We use it to record all the revenues and expenditures that are not in a special revenue fund. So it's sort of the administrative and operational fund of the government. We have, I'm pretty sure it's about 13 special revenue funds, and special revenue funds is money that's collected that has to be used for a specific project. Um, special revenue funds provide an extra level of accountability and transparency to taxpayers that their dollars are being spent for the intended purpose. So um, they're, they're color-coded there, so the, pur the purple ones, um, two of the, the most significant are stormwater and solid waste. So the revenue we collect, the expenditures go directly to support that effort. Um, the ones on the right side of there, they're like orangish, yellowish, those are impact fee funds. And that's revenue that's collected for, that's growth related. So I think one, the first one is fire rescue, um, parks, um, parks impact fees, we have law enforcement and transportation fund. So as the city grows, it's sort of a way of making it fair that the new people coming in have to pay a little bit for the extra services that are the city provides. 
oh, I almost forgot, capital project funds. We, and those are in the gray. We have three capital project funds. These are used to account for um, financial resources for the acquisition, construction of capital facilities. These include land, land improvements, building, building improvements, and any infrastructure. And the last one is a proprietary, which I mentioned already. Okay, what are our revenues? And this is why I wanted to explain the one on the right is business activities, that's the utility, and all the other revenues are in the governmental funds. Um, so where are, what are our revenue sources? 32% um, of our revenues are derived from property taxes, about six comes from franchise fees, 22% comes from other taxes, which is sometimes, it's a whole conglomerate, sales tax, public public utilities taxes. Um, we get 6% um, in state shared revenues, that comes directly from the state. Um, we also derive, I think that's 23%, from charges for service, and about the remaining 10 comes from grant revenue. On the Deltona water side, 83% of our revenue comes from charges for service when you pay your water bill, and about 15% is grant revenue. So how much do residents pay, and what are they paying for on their tax bill? Um, we all pay a property tax bill, which um, you're going to be getting your um, new assessment in August. Um, Property taxes are, pay, are paid on a millage rate, which is assessed for the value, assessed value of your home. So for every $1,000 of value of your home, you pay a millage rate. So for example, if your home is assessed by at $100,000, you divide that by 1,000 and multiply it by the millage rate, which for Deltona right now, this year is 7.65, so you would pay $765 a year in property tax. Um, this was the assessed, I mean the millage rate for 2023, the year we're currently in, last year it was 7.85. We also pay special assessments on our property tax bill. These are considered to be non-abvalorum taxes and they're for a specific service or for a district. So we all pay a stormwater fee and it's $128 per equivalent residential unit. And we also pay for solid waste, which is garbage pickup and yard waste pickup. And the amount we pay is $202.80 a year. We also have other special assessments, but um, they're for specific districts, like we have a street lighting district, we have a lake cleanup, and just the people that benefit from that um, pay into that um, assessment. Okay, and a question that comes up frequently is how much debt does the city have? Um, we do have a, a debt policy that was adopted by ordinance and also by the city's charter. Debt is issued for um, capital projects in the case of emergency or when it's appropriate to allocate the cost between um, the current and future beneficiaries. We also have uh, debt limitations to make sure that we're not exceeding our revenue sources. So um, it, this gets a little technical, but 110% of the year in which the greatest payments are is what our revenue source has to be, but the city has adopted a policy of 125% because we tend to be um, conservative. So this chart is uh, the total outstanding debt for the city of Deltona. It's divided into those two categories again, governmental debt and business debt. Business debt is the utility. So for 2022, the total outstanding bonds and debt for um, governmental funds were about 33 million and for the utility about 128 million. So what is the debt? For the government debt, we have two outstanding debt issues. The first one is from 2009, it's a stormwater, stormwater bank loan. Uh, the principal remaining is about $3 million. In 2016, they issued a capital improvement refunding bond, and a majority of this debt is for um, road improvements, and also a portion of this is to pay for the center. 
For Deltona Water, our outstanding debt for we issued a 2021 utility, it's a refunding bond, meaning we refinanced in 2021. The outstanding principal is 97 million, and we also have a Florida Department of Environmental Protection, their state revolving loan funds, about $30 million. This is sort of, um, it's grant and um, because it's from the state, we get a really super low interest rate and part of it is also grant funded. So it's a good revenue source. So the 2009 stormwater bank loan is a 20 year bond or note. Um, it was used to finance the capital improvements um, in the stormwater master plan. The debt service for that is paid from the non-avalorum non assessment on your property tax bill. So that $128 that we pay a year, part of that revenue goes to support this debt. In the 2016 capital improvement revenue bonds, um, that is to pay for road improvements and um, expansion projects. And um, this is funded out of uh, the pledge revenues for the half cent sales tax, um, public service taxes, and um, local uh, communication um, service taxes. For the utility, our 2021 utility system refunding bonds. Um, the 2021 bond refinanced the 2013 and 2014 bonds because we took advantage of the interest rates while they were low. Um, but the very first utility bond was from 2023, and that was for the purchase of the utility itself. So it's just like if you buy a house, you have a mortgage on it. So I know a lot of people see the 97 million, it's rather sticker shocking, but we had to buy the utility initially. Um, and then we did have to make improvements. Well, we refinanced the 23 bond in 2013, and 2014 they had to do additional improvements. And um, so the whole thing now was rolled into the 2021 bond. The state revolving loan funds are clean water, state revolving fund loans issued with the Florida Water Pollution Control Financing Corporation, which is a division of the Florida Department of Environmental Protection. Um, proceeds from these um, arrangement was used for the planning, design, pre-construction activities of the Eastern Wastewater Treatment Plant. So the debt service on these payments are made from the charges for service in the utility. So what is the city spending its money on? We do have an expenditure policy and um, we plan for the expenditures um, to have the resources to meet the objectives of the goals of the city and the residents. We do have budgetary control over the expenditures. Um, and the budget, um, each department is responsible for their budget. And uh, this time of year, um, from at the beginning of April, Departments have one month to submit their budget requests um, to the city, actually it goes to the finance department, we prepare a pre preliminary budget, it's reviewed by the city manager, and ultimately um, the city commission votes to approve the budget. So um, the slide that I, I thought this was interesting to know, this is just the general fund. So it's like, what are we spending money on? The biggest portion of the general fund goes to 58% is spent on public safety, which is the fire rescue services and law enforcement. We also spend about 6% on transportation. Um, about 10% is culture and recreation, so that's the parks department and the center. Less than 1% is desk service, which is the debt for uh, the center. And the rest is the general government to run the day-to-day -day operations of the city. So the second uh, chart, pie chart, shows you um, the operating expenses. About 41% is spent on operating expenses. Less than one is debt service. About 12% is transferred out to the others, other special revenue funds. And um, about 46% is spent on personal services, which is to pay city employees and associated expenses with them. Mary, so, can I stop you a second? Sure. When it comes to the budget process, you mentioned that it, it goes through the process, and, and mm -hmm. I want to back that up in a minute, but do you know when it'll go to city commission for final 
or first reading, second reading? Yes. Um, it's the, the city has to follow what's called the, the state's trim process. It's truth and millage. So we have a budget calendar that starts in April and it's finalized in October when we send our budget to the state to show them that we're in compliance. Um, there's a numerous meetings that are at the regular commission meetings, which it's if you would like to watch on TV or attend, I think it's a great idea. The first uh, um, meeting we have is on Monday night, and it's the pre-preliminary um, rate assessment for the special revenue funds. Then. That meeting is when uh, we present it to the commission, they vote to approve it. Um, then uh, the, uh, it gives the opportunity for residents to come to the second meeting, which is in August. So if you have any com complaints or comments you wanna make, you can do that at a commission meeting. They vote on it in August. So once that rate is established, we send that to property appraiser and they put it on the tax bill. Um, we also have, I think in July, I think the July 17th meeting, the commission will vote to set the millage rate. Once we have the millage rate, we can continue to prepare the budget. Because we don't, also an important date is June 1st is a preliminary, and July 1st is the day that the property assessor will send to us the assessed value for all the property in Deltona. Because if without that information, we can't prepare our budget. So um, the, uh, September is an important month. We have two meetings that we're required to have. The first one is usually the second week. It's right around Labor Day um, is when the budget, the preliminary budget is presented to the commission. And then the final budget is budget and um, millage rate is voted on by the commission. And I think it's, it's the third week in September. So once we have that, we submit everything to the property appraiser. Ultimately, we get the rest of the budget book together and send it to the state. So it's a long process. Yeah. A lot of meetings, a lot of discussion, a lot of taking in, put it out. Um, so. But again, Mary, uh, thank you, and but everybody's welcome, correct, to go to those public meetings yes, and to absolutely. participate, right. have comments, and be involved. Right. So thank you. Go ahead. Mm -hmm. Um, so these are expenditures citywide. 32% is spent by the Deltona Water. About 5% goes to capital projects. General f f fund is consumes about 44% of the expenditures and the special revenue is about 20%. I thought this would be interesting for you to know. This is part of our 23 budget. It's capital improvements. Um, and we've, this is uh, budgeted about $27 million in capital projects for 2023. And and um, stormwater is about two million, transportation, roads is about almost three. We have a community redevelopment area, I don't know if you're aware of. It's a special taxing district and it's near the Deltona Normandy area. It's, it was um, uh, uh, set up to address like blight and issues for an area that's more disadvantaged. Um, we have about 20,000 is municipal complex. That's this building here. And um, we also have budgeted $3 million in parks projects. Um, the biggest uh, source of our capital projects are the water sewer utility is about 16 million. And we also budget for equipment replacement for vehicles equipment about 2 million, 2.5. Um, I just wanna mention that, um, especially for like the utility, we budget it in this year, but a lot of these projects are so huge, um, they can't be completed in one year. And, and just because of the planning and the engineering that goes into it, also we have to apply for permits for through other government agencies like the state and St. John's Water Management District. So um, it's not unusual for any municipality for the funds to roll from one year to the next. So usually about November, December, we'll put together whatever you know, f we'll finish closing out the books and we'll roll the funds from one year to the next. Yes. Okay, Jazz. Sorry. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, the transportation figure up there, I got like a couple questions. Uh, does that include buses or is that just? No, buses are part of Lucia County. County. And that's, the, and that's the bus stops as well. Right. We don't do anything with the busing. Okay. Oh, good. Now I know who to talk to. It's Fortran. 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 B-O-T-R-A-N. Right. 
And do you, um, does your department approve any expenditures from these or are you just setting up how much money they have to spend and then other people decide where to spend it? Well, when you say how it's approved, so um, I think uh, Public Works manages the transportation area, so their department would prepare the budget. So they would, you know, take a look at all their operating expenditures, their personnel, and their capital projects. So they put their budget together for the year. Um, in finance, we assemble all all of this information for the entire city, and then there are meetings with the city manager and the department heads, and we go line by line through every um, expenditure and decide, yes, I really need this, no, this can wait another year. So then once the budget is put together in its entirety, it goes before the commission, the commission approves it, and, um, and then we have the final budget. But further, and I think it's a really good question, I'm glad you asked that, this budget document has the in the enforcement of like a legal document. So we cannot exceed any expenditures that are not in the budget. So, um, and like for example, Hurricane Ian and Hurricane Nicole, those were not budgeted expenditures. So that puts us in, we do have um, part of our financial policy is um, we allow for emergency purchase orders. So um, when the event was coming, it was like, we need pumps. We were calling everywhere in the state to get pumps and um, so we bypass the procurement process and the budget process in order to get these pumps. So then what's gonna happen, actually on the meeting on Monday, I'm gonna bring um, budget amendment before the commission to say, look, here is, um, it was almost close to $6 million of expenditures that were not budgeted. So part of our responsibility uh, as a city is we have to go to them and say, look, we need to amend the budget to approve these expenditures. And, um, and we also, so that sort of is a way to control the expenditures. So we can do, we do process amendments to the budget. They have to be approved by the commission by resolution because the budget is approved by resolution, it can't be changed without a budget resolution. Did that answer your question? Sure. Great, great okay. question. Okay. We have just a few more minutes, Mary. Okay, I think I'm doing, almost done. Doing okay, and then we'll take, I'll head down towards Brandy, but keep going. Okay, I just wanted to share with you, our website is www.deltonafl.gov, and if you go to departments and under finance, this is the annual comprehensive reports for, I think probably about 10 years are on there in PDF format, so you can go ahead and look at that, and also our budget documents for the last 10 years. So. And um, also, um, this is um, my contact information. If you have any questions, um, I'll be happy to answer any questions you have. Um, my phone number is also on the website, or you can just call the city here and ask for me. Um, there's an awful lot that goes into it, and I really appreciate if you would call and ask questions if you have any, um, because sometimes um, information gets can be turned around and um, I really we ha welcome the opportunity to you know, set the record straight so there isn't false information out in the city. Right. I'm actually glad to hear that because the previous director I sat with quite often to discuss this and then I got a kind of got a stop to it. So well, I would love to have well that, a meeting with yeah, you. Yeah, so let me just add this caveat because he is my boss. So I would need to get permission to have that conversation with you. Which so. is really confusing to me, but that that's fine. Well, um, I mean, I, I yes. understand your position. Okay. Well, I'd like to keep my job as Absolutely. well. Absolutely. And also, you know, it's Absolutely. a fine line. Um, one of my questions, and it's actually a, a discussion on our group, uh, is the budget timeline. Normally, mm -hmm. by April, we're seeing public meetings, we're hearing some um, items, and here it is June, and we're seeing our first one. Um, so I'm a little concerned about that because a commissioner had commented on our group that um, they have been sitting and going through these budget items, apparently, and have been voicing their own opinions outside of the public. And they, he stated that things are being done differently this time to save us money. So I'm just curious what is being done different this time in our process versus our, our typical route? Because like I said, I'm very involved in the finance mm -hmm. as, as a, a numbers person. Right. And as the years have went on, I've been kind of pushed out of that. So you wanting to see the true 
um, information put out there. I love hearing that. Mm -hmm. um, so if you could explain to us maybe why our process is a little behind sure. or is there a new process in place uh, based on this? And um, I'll just save the rest of the questions for a meeting. Thank you. Okay. Well, first of all, um, we are have to follow trim laws, okay. truth and millage set by the state and the property appraiser. So that's unmovable, unshakable. That's our deadlines. We can't miss them. Um, we, every time... We have a new management administration here. It's their prerogative to set their budget process. So, um, and that's, it's a management decision. Um, Mr. Chisholm comes with 17 years of experience at Day Daytona Beach. So he, it's his prerogative to bring into the city what he sees as the best way to manage the city. And, and, you know, it's been interesting because I get to work with three departments, and so I had to sit with Mary and her staff and the city manager, and, and, and you, you made this point earlier, as we sit down, we, we come forward with the things we need. We need new animal trucks. We need a new staff member, and, mm -hmm. and we have to justify it to them mm -hmm. so that, and, and sometimes we can walk away and go, no, well, we didn't get that truck. We got to, you know, maybe try next Sorry. year. So, no, 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 we, we get it. So, again, it's a team effort is, is where I was going is it takes all of us coming together just like last week when we talked about with city clerk how things tentacle out mm -hmm. it tentacles out and, right. and and we work together Brandy. well and really and to, to take that one step further you know we do meet with each department and then it's a, over a 200 million dollar budget so all these pieces have to come together to see what the bottom line is how much money we have are we short money so once you get to that point you have to make decisions and it's hard decisions at the city manager level what are we going to fund what are we going to put off to another year so because there are limited resources so bringing this whole thing together is why it's such we do start out with a budget calendar every year and i can't tell you we're on like revision number whatever so, and, you know, is it tough for us? Yeah. yeah. It is, but it's the way it is, so. Uh, mine was more a comment. Uh, you mentioned that the public can attend these meetings and be involved, but um, is there some way you can maybe bring back the information that we haven't had any public input meetings before they're already putting together the pre preliminary? And um, so it's kind of hard to be involved in those, you know, we're, we're not really involved in these meetings. Uh, we, we're not going to see it until now. Um, well, when it looks like that some of the commissioners have already been voicing their opinions on items. So that was just my okay. comment. Mary, your thought on that? Or? Um, so I'm sorry, what is your question actually? The, why some of the like commissioners the, have had meetings? No, she the, we the, 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 the commission so. meetings. I, I was right. referring to the yes, commission I meetings. The first one will yeah. be on Monday, and that will be right. the, a special assessment rate resolution. Right, which is so. more informational, not so much. Input. Well, yeah, I guess you have an opportunity to s express your opinion like you would in any commission meeting. Um, but not really be actively involved is my point. Well, Are you talking about kind of in the, the deeper, like when like I sit down with them about the code budget? Right. Well, like usually like year after year, we've, we've sat and we mm -hmm. have did line item budgets and we have discussed what's important mm -hmm. to the community and what's not before it kind of got to this uh, point. I mm -hmm. got you. any of those. So. Uh, mm -hmm. okay. Almost, uh, um, process. Right. Almost yes. like kind of some focus groups kind of? It, it's very similar. Okay. Have doing. you done that in the past? Ah, good. Right. I, I We can carry that upstairs as far as, you know, maybe here moving forward. That would be kind of really interesting to get the community involved that way. So, no, we thank it's you. But, I, yeah, no, that's yeah, a great idea. That's uh, We appreciate yeah, that. Yeah, well, Brandy, and, she's been around for so many years. Right, uh, right. She and, knows. <laughs> right, and, 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 you know, sometimes, again, why reinvent the wheel? If something worked years ago, maybe we can reinvent it and bring it back. So, no, we thank you, Mary. Mary, that was amazing. I mean, I get to work with Mary. I probably see her every day. I don't have to ask her questions every day. But um, that was an amazing presentation. So oh, I think you. I even learned something um, that I didn't know. So we well, appreciate I'm glad to hear you. that. I was I was actually afraid I would bore you guys to tears. No, <laughs> no, it was fabulous. Let, let's right. give her a round of applause. Thank you very much, Mary. Thank you. So I did forget to introduce, we do have a new resident student here today, and I'm going to take the microphone to her. Um, this is her first visit with us, and if she'll tell us her name and a little bit about what her interest is in being here today. 
Hi, everybody. Um, my name is Kathleen Perez. I recently moved to Deltona in 2021 from South Florida. Um, and my reason for being here is getting to know a little bit about the city and what it has to offer and how we can voice our opinions and how the city adapts to those opinions that we give. So that's my main reason for being here. That's awesome. And, and uh, does anybody need a break or can we move right into community development? Do you want to take a five minute break? Oh, no, we're good? Break or no break? Oh, we're okay. We're going to keep rolling then. And so now we get to hear from Angelia Briggs. Angelia is our manager of the community development uh, division that handles our CDBG grants, our SHIP funds, and all kinds of exciting things. And Angelia is very dedicated. She has a, an awesome team. And I'm going to turn it over to her and welcome Angelia. Good morning. Can everybody hear me? Hey, how are you? My name is Angelia Briggs. I'm the manager of the community development department. I'd like to introduce uh, the other two current staff members from community development, Damaris, Don, if you would stand up. We have Ms. Damaris Miranda. Ms. Miranda has been with the city for 13 years, Damaris. Uh, we started the same year, and Damaris has held several positions, not just in community development, but you probably saw her up front and code and everything. So she's a wealth of information. When, they had, when we had the opportunity to grab her, we grabbed her. <laughs> and uh, Mr. Don Hoppe, he has been with us for two years. He's, he's what I call my work husband, our work husband. He, he carries the heavy things around for us. So thank you, Don. Thank you, Damaris. And when we get to the questions, Damaris and Don are going to be helping me answer the questions for you guys. Okay. So community development. Maybe not. I'll come help. Is it on? Oh, there oh, you go. I'm going the wrong way. <laughs> so, first I'd like to say that uh, we thank you all for participating in the Academy. It kind of dovetails with what we like to do is get information out in the community to our residents so that they can share those with their friends, their neighbors, their clubs, and anyone else. So we can expend our grant funding. And we find a lot of times that that's how we uh, are able to expend that grant funding by people that we've talked to or spoken to, giving the information to others. So having said that, we're gonna start with our org chart. Of course, Suzette is our boss. I'm the manager. Again, we have Damaris Miranda, who is the housing coordinator. She basically runs the grants with the applications and the processes like that. Um, she helps with the advertising. And then Don is training to, he's currently the admin, but he's training to also in the future become a housing coordinator. So as of today, we are the department of three. But as of tomorrow, hopefully we'll have a department of four. Our financial analyst position has been filled. That position was held by Mary Lyson. And you know how long Mary's been in finance. So we've been out without that position for a while. And Don, Damaris, and I have been covering to manage that. So we're going to go back. And Angelia, if I could, uh -huh. just say a little something about, you know, it took us a long time to fill it because it's such a special um, area. Would you just emphasize that for me, please? Um, as we're going to get to in, a, in this slide, we receive funding from various sources, federal and state. Mainly the federal sources, they have federal databases. Any of you that's, that have been here for years know about NSP. For each uh, funding source we have, we have a separate state or federal database that we have to account for the funds. We spend the funds. And in one case, they give us the funds, we spend them. We still have to account for it when it comes to the state. With the federal funds, we, we expend the funds, and then we have to go in and request those funds be ref, uh, refunded to us. And we're supposed to do that like every three months. Uh, so it can get a little time consuming. Um, so that's why we need that financial analyst that uh, we were lucky enough to find someone that already has their, what we call our IDIS 
sales numbers, they have um, experience with working with IDIS and working with federal grants uh, because uh, we're not sure, especially with CARES and, and, CR, and CDBG, um, it's just a lot of um, financial accounting. So we were finally able to get someone after about five years, and they start tomorrow, yay for us. But what we're going to talk about is what our responsibilities are. Our main responsibility is normally affordable housing assistance. Um, we provide rental, down payment assistance. We help repair. Uh, we also work with disaster assistance. The day after the hurricane, our entire staff, we were in the cars with code enforcement riding around. We were looking to see, to figure out how we wanted to plan a program that would assist the residents of Deltona. So if we saw a lot of trees being down, we knew we needed to concentrate on debris and tree removal. If we saw um, electricity and stuff like that, or roofs, we wanted to be able to form that program that we would have about two weeks to present to Tallahassee, to say, the funds that you gave us, this is how we want to use them. So we do work with m most departments, actually. We work with code, we work with finance, we work with all of the building department out front. Um, we also work with communications because we're always trying to get that message out to the residents. So we have a unique uh, situation where we pretty much work with almost every department, parks and rec, uh, stormwater, and as you see, you'll see some of the work that we do. We do infrastructure funding. We try to find a project every year that we can do infrastructure improvements to. Uh, those normally run about two years because of the dynamics associated with infrastructure, but we use that funding for infrastructure, uh, like we mentioned before. Every park that's in an area of greatest need, we will do parks projects in those. I think we have replaced everything that you can replace at um, Firefighters Park, Manny Rodriguez. Um, we put in the zip line originally at Festival Park. So we look for those places where we can expend the money. Um, we also work with public services. Every year in our CDBG cap, there is about 15% of that annual allocation that we can allocate to local nonprofits and public service entities. We do that consistently every year. Uh, last year, we found a way to uh, provide some additional monies based on our CDBG CARES. So in addition to the funding that we gave, say, New Hope Baptist for rent, mortgage, and utility assistance, Assistance. We and and also the neighborhood center. We also provided them with an additional. I think it was twenty twenty five thousand dollars each to help with rental and utility. And I'm happy to say that they're expending that money, helping people stay in homes, especially with the evictions with rental. Um, Angelia, can I have you tell them what we're going to uh, award this year about the? Or is that in your presentation later? Or? It, no, we okay. did not get in. So right now, we are in the process of awarding. We still have to expend some funds on an infrastructure project that didn't um, quite get started because of the disaster. So we're going to spend approximately a half a million dollars in reference to that infrastructure retrofits that's piping that needs right. to be addressed. The, the monies I was talking about is when we were vetting through your nonprofits about how much are we going to offer to the nonprofits? Um, uh, roughly about $75,000. Total. Right. So, so think about that, residents. It's it's pretty neat that there's five or six nonprofit organizations in your community that applied for this these grant dollars. We have a team that vets out those applications, and then these awards will be made up to about seventy five thousand dollars. It's pretty incredible. It is. Thank you. So, having said that, we're gonna move to the dollar amounts. Now, these are estimates. For instance, when you see that 1700000 it's supposed to be, that's a combination of what we call SHIP, which is State Housing Initiative Program. We get that from the state, Tallahassee. So that's a combination of those funds, plus right up under it, you see HHRP, which is Hurricane 
mayors help me? Hurricane repair. Housing repair. That's it, hurricane housing repair program. I knew I should have typed it out. Hurricane housing repair program. That was money that we got due to the hurricane. So that, uh, that amount at the top encompasses the 400,000. Um, Damaris and Don will be using that for rental assistance, owner-occupied repair, down payment assistance, disaster if needed, rent assistance if needed. Um, we are in the process of reinstating our subject to sewer for anyone that needs uh, sewer assistance, so we're in the process of doing that over the next six months. In addition to that, it pays for a majority or a portion of our administration. Um, and we also do counseling with those funds. Uh, we are looking for ways to in, invest or support affordable, true affordable, either multifamily or single family. We are running into a situation where we're getting a lot of phone calls in reference to people being evicted. And all of you know, at this time, it's almost impossible if you have an affordable income to buy a home at this time. So what do we do? We have to look at other options and sources, and we're in the middle of doing that. We hope eventually we can come to you with a program in the next six months that would um, take care of some of those issues. Can, can I take that a little further? Yes, ma'am. Because Angelia doesn't shout out for her team very often, but her team, her under her leadership and her team, they work with the ad hoc um, committee, which is an affordable housing committee. It's about, what, 12 people, maybe, give yes. or take. Mm -hmm. And what they've been doing over the last few months is they've had ad hoc members and elected officials coming together with staff to have some brief conversations about where we're headed towards with with our uh, affordable housing initiatives, and as Angelia mentioned, then it will end up in front of the city commission. Yes, um, because we looked at the numbers, and if you make $15 an hour, which is gonna be the new normal, and, two, and you have two incomes that make $15 an hour, you, can't aff you can afford to buy roughly a $180,000 house. That's not gonna happen in this market. So we're looking at other options for housing affordability. Um, and at this time, not multifamily, but it will be a three-pronged uh, um, uh, event. We're gonna start with single family, then look into some other sources. We hope that down the line, we can get, when we say multifamily, we're not talking two and three stories, we're not sure, but more of for um, elderly, and uh, persons with disabilities to start with, and then we can fill in the rest after that. Um, so that's what we're working with with our SHIP and our HHRP funds. On, on our CDBG funds, again, we're gonna do some stormwater retrofits. Uh, there is a parks project that's waiting in the wings. Should stormwater not perform, we will have to flip that and try to get that done within a six to eight month period. Again, housing if need be, uh, we can use CDBG funds for that. And then also, it does pay some grant admin. So that grant admin does not come out of general funds. The final uh, pot of money that we have right now is our CARES funding. Uh, back in January, February of 2021, I would actually say March, we received a CARES funding one, which was about 370 some thousand dollars. Because we expended those funds, they gave us an additional 300 and maybe 20,000. So the 307 that you see there is the remaining funds, and it's actually for 31 that we've spent already. So we have a remaining 307, 264 to expend. Again, these funds are people that have been affected by CARES, and we're working with a program to possibly dovetail that with re-education. Instead of just giving money, we want to that carrot that's, you know, hey, you wanna go back, 
learn a new uh, occupation. Maybe we can pay some rent assistance for you, for you and some utility assistance for you to make it easier. So if you need child care, you need um, other funding, it just makes it easier for you to concentrate on your studies. So we're thinking about using that for uh, the CARES funding and connecting it to if they have been affected by CARES. So basically, this is our vision. It's a lot to read. Uh, we'll be help, uh, happy to send it to you. But basically it just says we'll work with the AHAC committee to ensure that there's affordable housing in Deltona. Uh, we continue to work with our local partners like the County of Volusia, City of Daytona Beach, the Continuum of Care, Health Department, and the West Volusia Collaborative, in addition to any nonprofits or for profits that would like to work with us. I can say that the Community Development Division, we do have a standing seat on the Applications Committee for the Continuum of Care. We sought that seat because we wanted to make sure that the city of Deltona had representation with the federal funding that came to the Volusia Flagler Continuum of Care. And we still have that seat, we maintain it, we attend the meetings, we vote on the funding. We wanted to do that for our residents. Um, we are in the process of completing our analysis of impediments. That's a document that basically says, this is your Bible, this is what you should be doing with your CDBG, care, your CDBG money over the next five years. So we're in the process of finishing that up. Uh, we will continue to advocate for economic and de uh, commercial development, and we want to initial conversations regarding housing that's safe, vibrant, sustainable, and inclusive, and that dovetails with our gallery of villages approach. And finally, we ensure that the funds received are appropriately expended by continuing to properly administer the grant funds. Some people will be told no, but sometimes we have to have, tell the 10% no so that we can re, uh, retain the funds for the 90%, unfortunately. These are just some of the key performance measures. You can go down and you can read those. I just wanna make one quick note. We did some um, information to present to uh, Mr. Chisholm and to Suzette over the past month. And we realized that our three-person staff, we were spending one full day a week just on the phones, just on the phones, just on phone calls. So this doesn't really represent it, but when you look at it that way, we're on the phone for one full day, then we have four days to manage our grants, take walk-ins, and what we're hoping by talking to you all is that you all will get our message out in the community because we're still trying to get back out in the community and attend events and let persons know about all these wonderful products that we have. We still have funding and we hope that you all will assist us with getting that message out to your clubs, to your churches, to your friends, to your neighbors. Um, we do have cards over on the table. We welcome any information, any insight, any proposals you may have. Uh, we would like to be able to, with your okay, and if Seth, Suzette would be okay with it. When we start developing our programs, we'd like to in the future reach out to you all and ask you for your input on those. You know, Angelie, it's, it's neat you say that because one of the things I've done in my career is run alumni associations and it would be kind of neat to kind of have almost like an alumni association with our Citizens Academy and to get them involved. So that was a great point. Could I ask you to step back just for a second and, and, and you talked about sometimes applications get denied and I know some folks go to go or watch the city commission meetings and in June we you and I presented to the city council a application for expenditure and the reason I want to bring this up is tell us the dollar amount that we have to go in front of the city commission and why any we call it we call it a purchase order we have bank accounts you know fi finance has the accounts but in order for us to spend a dollar there has to be a purchase order in place as in we have to go to finance and say hey 
we want to spend this on this, and this is who we're going to give it to. So the commission um, in, I think it was, don't quote me on it, 2021 or 20, early 2022, um, put a mandate in place that says any PO purchase order, $25,000 and above, would have to go in front of the commission. So, although we reviewed it based on our guidelines, this project, and it met our basic guidelines, the commission, because they are the governing body of this city, they have the right to say no. Right, and another thing that the team is working on right now is a, a project with Habitat for Humanity, and Angelia uh, oversees a program called Down Payment Assistance, and that's a real exciting program as well, and we will be presenting in July, um, hoping to move that one forward to give a family uh, down payment assistance yes. to help buy a new home. Yes, it's a currently single mother who has a disabled son. Um, he's, uh, he's over 20, uh, but when they begin this process, I want to ask you guys. It was her husband and her and her son. Since then, her husband passed away, and now it's just the son and the mother. And it took us about two weeks. There was going some going back and forth. It was just a little bit unusual, but we were able to finally, I think it was Monday or Tuesday, get on the phone with Habitat and figure out a way to make this work. And it came down to. Some of you remember funding that we gave Habitat, or actually property that we gave Habitat for NSP. The idea behind that is when we do that, I'm just going to say this. Governments do not manage properties well, housing, multifamily, and, and that. Because we think, believe it or not, sometimes with, we want to think with our hearts, but we have to answer to you guys. So we can't do things that other entities can't. So we search out those entities that dovetail with what we think the residents want, but sometimes don't have the restrictions that we have. So we've partnered with Habitat for Humanity. We've partnered with Mid Florida Housing in the past with the NSP. Uh, in this case, Habitat had those two houses sitting out there that they've been receiving rental and assistance on. Be, uh, well, actually mortgage, because they're buying the home. So Habitat retained the funds. They came back and said, well, can we take some of those funds that we've been receiving on one of the NSP homes and help this woman and her child get into this house? And we're happy to say that we were able to broker that deal, and that should be moving forward. And anyone that wants to go to the grand opening, let us know. That's okay. exciting. Um, could Don have the microphone for a minute? Because I, I, you know, it's it's great that we have our leadership here, but it's also awesome to talk to the staff. And so, Don, tell us what's in your day one of the biggest challenges you face in the unit, please. Hello, again, my name is Don Hoppe. I'm the admin in the housing and development side. And it varies, it's never a dull moment. You can come in one day and the phones can be ringing off the hook or the emails are there, they gotta be addressed. So each day is a little different. Sometimes folders need to be worked on, satisfactions need to be drawn up, recorded, sent to the city clerk. There's just a multitude. In fact, right now my brain is just going of around all the things that I need to accomplish right. today right. that I want to do. So it's a it's a multitude. It's just not one task. It's it's different. So it, and that's the one thing I like about the housing and and community development side is it's it's never routine. You're always doing something, and and that's where I appreciate. Angelia and Damaris, because they are true, I call them superheroes, I call them wonder women, mm -hmm. simply because without their help, I've come so far. Just to give you just a quick example, the ship, you know, when I first heard ship, I said, ship, what, are we going on a cruise or what? Yeah. And you know, then eventually I found out, you know, it's that state, the housing um, partnership, initiatives partnership, so I've come such a long way learning. I actually came from an IT background, so in the time I've, after 
I've been laid off, I obviously was looking for employment. I found Deltona, got hired, because I had administrative background. And so I feel I've come a long way. And it's really, you get that satisfaction. I really love it when we have a, the owner-occupied repair, the roof grant, something like that, where you actually go out in the city and see these people you know, deserving of what they really need, a new air conditioner, a new roof, and it's, that's the exciting point, actually seeing it in action, not just in the paperwork, but actually seeing the final product. So that's one of the treats on working in this department. And, and like I said with Suzette, yeah, it's, it's just a multitude of, right. of facets. Well, we thank you, Don. And Damaris, I'm going to put you on the spot now. Damaris uh, spends a lot of her time, you know, vetting through the applications. And, you know, sometimes people qualify, as Angelia said, and sometimes they don't. So what would you say is one of the biggest challenges as you're going through applications uh, where from people seeking assistance? Good morning. I, like they said, I'm Damaris Miranda. And um, the challenges we see is residents just bringing in all the required documentation that we need for the program to approve them. Um, bank accounts. You know, all the monies for these programs, all the money coming into the household has to be included as part of the household, being um, wages, retirement funds, pensions, um, Social Security, child support, all these, in, all this income has to be included, and they don't want to understand that, they don't want to provide the documentation, child support is another big one. It, they, it's it like you're getting be, into their intimacy of their business, and, and they don't they want don't to like disclose it, it. They don't but like by it. our policies and procedures and requirements, we have we to get them. that data. And that becomes a big issue. So they drop out or they'll just won't come back. And Damaris, what happens if we go ahead and put that file through and then we get audited? We'll get fired. <laughs> <laughs> or, or we get audited. Right. And once we get audited, all the documentation has to be there. As far as we ask for the owner occupy repairs, six months of bank statements. We need all the pages of the bank statements. Even if it is a blank page, we need to have it in that file. If not, they'll take the money from us after we've awarded it. So we have to be very meticulous in how we see that file, review the file, and approve the file. Wow, that's amazing. Does, does anybody have questions, Chaz? That's what I was, Angelia, do you want to come back up front and let's see if we have a few questions before we wrap up our session? Thank you. Um, household income. Everybody, all the income coming into the household. What if it's, what if they're not related? What if they're like roommates? Do you still combine? I mean, they're not financially responsible for each other. I mean, what do you do in a situation like that? Did you want to answer? That's a great question. It is. A household income is not determined by the city. It's determined actually by the federal government. It comes down to the state, to us. So they have determined that anyone living in a household that makes 10 cents as income has to be counted because it is household income. If you live in the household, we need your income. And we are very stringent about that. I'm happy to say we've never had to pay a penny back. We almost did once. But we, we are very stringent about that. It was to the point we were going to have to pay some money back uh, because we did not get a saving statement. We missed getting two of the six-month saving statements for the daughter. And um, they, were good. they wanted to take the money back. I had to meet the daughter at the... Is it, Wells, is it Wells Fargo that used to be over by Duncan? Yep, it's closed now, but it's over by Duncan in, in um, Kentucky Fried Chicken. I had to meet her there eight months later, go into the bank with her and get the print out of the two-month statement. They're very strict about that, and I'm happy to say, so far so good for 12, 13 years. So we'll see. Wow, thank you. Any other questions? Okay, Troy. 
Thanks. Can you define a little more solidly what affordable housing means in terms of rent versus mortgage? Is it a percentage of an income? Like when we say we want to build more or get more affordable, what denotes that that is affordable and that one's not? Okay, it's on 30% of their income. It's gross. Is that a gross rent income. Uh, rental, there's a for rental, there's a rental schedule, and that's that's different. But for um, owner owner arc and uh, repair, it is 30% of the gross. And again, those income limits come down from the federal government and uh, state of Florida. They're given to us annually. You'll see sometimes when we change it, and we're waiting on it. Like this year was late, I think, Damaris. Came in May, mid May it came in, and usually it comes in in April. So we have to keep up and change all those income limits on our applications, on our website. Does, does that help, Troy? And uh, like I say, we have the ad hoc committee, and that's a great uh, uh, set of residents that are very involved, very engaged, and very diversified. I think we have some realtors on there. We have some retired people, mm -hmm. um, some educators, and, you know, different... And you're going to see some things coming soon that they are taking a bold step to try to put in place. I hope and I think that everyone will be happy with what they're trying to do. But again, we're here if you have any questions or concerns. And again, their business cards are, well, let's give them a round of applause. Thank you very much, uh, team. Their business cards are over here. Um, thank you, guys. Don't forget in the envelope there, there's the amazing uh, venomous snake uh, thing for you to read. And oh, Don wants to say something. Go ahead. I just want to make a final comment, parting comment. I would encourage you, for example, the new member to the academy, you may or may not know. I would encourage each one of you, go on the website and look at each department. Ours is broken out, housing and community development. It'll list all the active programs. Maybe you were unaware, oh, we have a roof grant, we have owner-occupied repair, we have that down payment assistance, we have the mortgage rent utility. Share it, you know, if you know of a friend, a neighbor that may be in assistance for that, you know, let them know. Because the website is, is invaluable. And every time on the phone, ironically, I'll hear on the phone and, you know, I'll mention to the resident, well, I, you know, have you looked at our web, the website? Use that as a resource. It's invaluable. It's got a lot of good information. Just like Mary showed you with finance, there's the city clerk building a multitude of information out there for you to absorb. And so if you have a friend, you know, I need a new roof, but you know, I just don't have a resource. I need a new air conditioner. You know, it, the help is out there, the assistance is out there. Granted, all of the programs we have are income qualifiable, but there's that possible resource out there. So I just, you know, um, advise one of the Good sources of information is that website. And like it's Angelia was saying, exactly, yeah. And like Angelia was saying, uh, feel free to take one of our business cards on the housing side, we have it, or give it to a friend or a neighbor that may be in need of something, because we got money to spend. <laughs> we do. Okay. Well, thank you, thank Don. Thank you. That was a great. You can hang up. Hang it up there. So, thank you. So, no, that was amazing. And and one thing that you know we did code compliance and we did CDBG today. But what happens is is too is we bring those folks together because again, Angelia's team has money for roof repairs. We have code enforcement that needs roofs repaired. So again, as you can see, right, Zachary, the tentacles continue to go around, and we come together and. It's, it's an amazing machine. It really is. And so I'm going to go to Mike today. What's a takeaway? Mainly that everybody seems to be working all together to, to help the residents of Deltona. Uh, I picked up several things, but then I, well, I've got a couple of big dogs. We've been in trouble in the past. Uh, one of them is not with, no longer with us, but, but uh, anyway, uh, and code enforcement is very, very, very forward with what they do. Uh, you know, I didn't realize you were as big as you are. That's good. At least, what, 20 people working all day? Through the day, you have lots. I see the trucks all the time, but anyway, I'm, I'm just saying 
for a city of 98,000 people, you guys, you know, are bringing it all together. It's, and this is a very interesting, you know, way that we can participate, so. Well, I, I thank you, and I want to go back to, as, as Angelia was talking about, our new staff member coming on Friday. Some of the jobs here in city government are very specific, and, and, and that's why it's taken them five years to really find somebody that was wanting to come here, number one, but had what we need to get the job done. So I'm going to ask Robert for a takeaway, and then we're going to wrap it up. Oh, um, I'm kind of hung up on the water because I'm a sewer person and I get paid, you know, it costs me nine times more than somebody that's not on water. And I noticed that the city has decided to uh, extend their debt. Okay. It was supposed to expire in 2045. They would have all the, uh, the initial bonds matured. Now I imagine that they've added to it and it's probably somewhere way out there, like 2075, I haven't looked into that. But it seems like the state doesn't, I mean, the city doesn't want to pay off anything. They're just deferring the interest and the interest payment of 0.7% is not gonna cover the debt. And it's just gonna, our kids or our grandkids are gonna be paying for this stuff forever. Oh, that was that was a good point. Good point. You know what? I'm going to ask Kathleen. She this is her first visit. What's the takeaway you can share with us? For me, I guess the takeaway was Deltona is still a work in progress. There's uh, lots that um, I learned. Um, lots that I guess in part. As a citizen, I'd like to know a little more, delve a little deeper um, to where we can get into the nitty gritty of things and actually see how and where we can solve these issues. Okay. You know, that, that, that's amazing. And, and again, I think it takes community involvement. It takes people wanting to come to meetings, wanting to get involved and, and, and wanting to, you know, share their input. And do, do you agree with me? I think that's what it takes. It's your community and, and, and we need to hear from you. So I thank you. Any final questions? You do have the agenda. We'll see you, you know, next week we'll have the building department. You have a new building official that came on in April. Uh, we'll have our planning department and then we'll have our human resource and risk management department. So I look forward to that. I wish you a very good week and I thank you for being with us and have a great day.